Welcome to the Zinoff podcast series on Hyperintelligent Automation, or HIA. HIA is a technology born from the confluence of AI and RPA that has evolved from being a conventional automation tool to a strategic enterprise game changer. In this series, we bring to you our conversations with leading automation gurus and industry mavericks on how they are defining new possibilities and business outcomes through automation. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another exciting episode of the Zenov podcast, Hyperintelligent Automation Series, the most revered destination to listen to the who's who of the global automation industry. I am Praveen Badada, managing partner at Zenov, and I will be your host today. Today, we have with us John Jed Turkov, who is the Chief Customer Strategy and Transformation Officer at Blue Prism. For over two and a half decades, Jet has been working on and leading global transformation initiatives that deliver positive results. He has become one of the most respected voices on connected RPA, intelligent automation, and building and scaling a digital workforce. Jet has also served as the chairman of the diversity committee for one of the largest banks in Europe, and he is constantly involved in philanthropic efforts as well. Great to have you with us here, Jet. And thank you for joining in. Uh, it's great to be here, Praveen. Very much looking forward to this. Sounds good. So let's get started and dive uh, right in. Uh, in your story career for about 26 years, you've seen the role of tech and technology evolve to serve the needs of different industries, more specifically uh, the banking, financial services, insurance industry. You've been both a user and provider of technology in your roles over these years. And the, the first question that I want to get started with is to hear your views in terms of the, the mega shifts, the macro big picture shifts that you've seen in the way technology has evolved over these years. It's, well, it's been, you know, at a, a pace and speed, I think that uh, many of us didn't expect, quite honestly. You know, we hear about um, the replacement uh timelines for technology such as PCs and, and computers uh, going from two years to one year, nine months, six months, just because the new technology that comes out in the hardware that we use every single day. We see it in our, our, our mobile devices that we all carry around in some shape or form, the constant upgrades and the, the new applications that are available on those. So I think, you know, as, as I look back and think about, you know, what were we doing in the late eighties, early nineties in the companies that I worked for like GE and HSBC, Credit Suisse, Sparebank, got to go through that on a timeline banking or from Ellen, my last financial institution where I worked before joining the software industry. You know, I think what we've seen is that it has gone through a period of, if we started, if you wanted to do transformation work, people usually couch that around something like a big ERP platform. That was going to be the trick. That was going to solve all the problems. It was going to be these massive platforms that you brought in to completely in, in back in those days, we thought of it as almost revolutionary in the way that things would be done and how we were going to be on a single platform to do finance, HR, uh, tax audit, you know, all these types of things were housing these. You fast forward to today and you can see the incremental steps that we, we soon learned that the cost and the, the likelihood of success of the getting the expectations out of this massive investment just never really materialized. It may have in some organizations, but it, it didn't probably, if you look at the statistics now, uh, some of the most recent things out by uh, the likes of some of your uh, colleagues in places like McKinsey and Bain BCG that do surveys with uh, large lots of CEOs. And you know, the most recent one, less than a year old, uh, 1,600 global CEOs said that their digital transformation efforts weren't meeting their expectations. I don't think that's a, a new phenomenon. I think what's happened is now organizations are figuring out that there's uh, uh, let me call them micro technologies now that can actually help supercharge their transformation efforts. Things like RPA, things like machine learning, things like chat, a, a number of these intelligent automation components that have 
in in by themselves may not make that much of an impact but when you combine them together in a suite what they figure out is they can they can leave existing uh erp platforms and these big systems that they've had in place for a long time they use these smaller micro technologies you bundle them together and almost like platforms and you're able then to create some massive change that they couldn't do uh, or may not have been able to get that fulfillment that they were looking for out of their ERP platforms. Now they're able to achieve that. So I think we've seen this move from the, these big platforms now into thinking about automation as a key C-suite initiative to help them achieve the transformative natures. And I'll, I'll end this with just saying the, the reason we're seeing it becoming more and more important today is we're facing a labor shortage. Um, birth rates globally are, have been going down for the last two, two to three years. Nobody who follows this believes that that's going to change anytime soon. So if we believe now all of us are trying to hire workers and, you know, find the talent. If we think it's tough now, it's going to get worse. You have to find an alternative workforce to be able to take on work that's suited for a more digital way of getting it done and then allowing these the human workers that we we still want to have we still desperately need to do the work that the companies want them doing things like interfacing with customers things like working in innovation areas things like being creative empathetic all these areas are very very important and still solely only the domain of human workers and so you know, I think again, the technology is having to move towards us to enable this kind of happening to go on. If not, these organizations are going to find themselves very in a very difficult situation in in the next few years. And so again, I think that technology shift, we wouldn't be able to do this digital labor force in a big ERP platform as we traditionally would know it. We need those platforms. Don't get me wrong. We work with them all day long. You need something in the middle there that helps enable a different kind of labor, an alternative labor force to get work done. And I think, again, that's probably been the most significant shift I've watched. As you think back about how this slowly began to point towards this direction, and COVID really did accelerate that to a precipice that said, we don't really have a choice. We have to figure out how to make a smarter digital workforce to enable people to do the things that we want them to be doing. I had such a lovely and very interesting viewpoint, uh, Jet, right? The whole, I would call it as disintermediation of the platform and integration through micro technologies, uh, which is the phase uh, which we are obviously going through. And like you said, the, co the COVID situation kind of uh, pushed a lot of enterprises into adopting mm -hmm. platforms like automation and many other surrounding technologies. I want to pick up uh, from there and ask you this question on, you know, now that we are slowly starting to come out of the, out of the pandemic, what are some of the permanent changes, uh, you know, that'll be there in your belief, right? As your customers adopt more such micro technologies, including RPA and intelligent automation, what are some of the permanent shifts uh, that you are likely to witness over the next few years? Well, I think we all know that you know, our workforces around the world are going to find it very hard to come back and work in an office five days a week. I mean, we see it all the time, at least across the Americas, Western Europe, uh, and in, in a lot of the areas in APAC as well. Uh, you know, you just change the behavior in people for two years. And then if you believe that they're going to come back all of a sudden because that you decide you want them there, Remember, we are in a shortage, and so if they don't like that, there's a lot of jobs out there for those people. So I think what that's also forced the hand of corporations to figure out is, okay, if we're going to have this distributed workforce now, working some in the office some days a week, some out in the remote like we've been doing for the last two years, and very successfully, by the way, um, why is it that, what's the motivation to have people come back into the office? And so I think one of the things is, is the experience with the technology that they're going to be using. Um, as organizations shift and as, as people like myself and others work with big corporations, small, medium as well, on rethinking about their current labor force. How do you look at labor? How do you look at your jobs? How could you reimagine that work? 
to be done in a different way. Because if you use people first automation, which is kind of one of our mantras, the way we think about it, use a people first automation approach, you would never build the processes like you have them today. So I think what you're going to see is one of the permanent changes is, is this continual, almost, almost back to the old six sigma lean sigma continuous improvement, but with a, a large leap where it's really focused on not just incremental improvement, but how do we completely reimagine anything that we're doing? How do you reimagine a mortgage process? How would you reimagine a payment process? How would you reimagine a sales process where you have these new technologies available to you? You can bifurcate work between the work areas that you want digital workers to participate in and you educate them, i.e. you put more and more intelligence in them through the, the things like, you know, Hadoop and R and you put uh, data ingestion engines, many of those out there, OCR, ICR engines, uh, computer vision engines. You give them talk capabilities, so you put chat engines in them. So you're starting to do a lot of those things and these companies are going to need to be able to adjust to that because the, their human labor force is going to say, I don't want to do that kind of work anymore. I don't want to even work in the way that I was working before. There's an interesting bit of research came out from Deloitte. You know, there's always been this thing about when you bring automation in, everybody's fearful of their jobs. Well, we've already seen that's not actually true. You actually create new jobs and you can actually train the workers when you take things away from them that you'd rather have a digital worker because they're more capable of doing that in a lot of ways. And then you give them new types of roles and tasks that are really more challenging, more fulfilling, more advancing for their own careers, more engaging for them within the way that they want to lead their lives. Interesting when Deloitte asked their employees about, and they have thousands and thousands of them about the, the use of technology, the fear of technology, the results were very interesting because uh, the majority of the people that responded to the survey said, yes, give me automation technology to make my job better and easier than what I'm doing it today. And insights from that, when they did the follow-ups were things around the work of what is it, the kind of work that the humans wanted to do, the kind of work that they could see that they were asked to do, that they would be happy to give to an automation uh, entity, whether it's a digital worker or a BPM platform, what are those kinds of things? But very, very willing to do that. So I think what you're going to see now because of the pandemic is a shift in you know, this really kind of people first automation approach. And you're going to see the acceleration of technologies that are going to enable that to happen. And you're going to, those organizations then will have this opportunity to do this reimagination of work and really purposely thinking about where do you want humans involved in that process? Where do you want humans involved in that workflow? And where can the rest of that work be done in a secondary labor force way? And I think that's going to be very, very big. Uh, we're seeing more and more of those conversations coming up. Um, it's not for the faint of heart because it's hard to do. It's very difficult to do. And, but you can see the, or, the organizations that are pushing the edge and there's a massive bank that's located, headquartered in the UK, um, that they've asked us to come in and help them think that through, you know, they're already very, very good at using digital workers, but how do you move it to more of a transformative discussion? Because they know they can't keep working the same way. And I think that's really, really important. But I think this is a really interesting viewpoint because that's all we've been uh, looking at offshoring and globalization uh, for about 20 years. In fact, today's our birth, uh, birth date as well. So we're born. Well, oh, happy here. birthday. Yeah. So um, for 20 years, you know, we have seen this industry grow uh, exactly the way you talked about in its maturity and things like those. And it's interesting that that's kind of similarity in the way RP and automation is evolving. And it's very unique uh, point of view. I think the one debate that happened because of offshoring and later globalization is uh, who should be the custodian of running these kind of operations, right? Should it be with business? Should IT get involved? Uh, there was this concept of business services trying to, you know, uh, show up their hands in terms of owning globalization initiatives and so on. We are almost seeing a similar conversation pick up in automation, right? Like who should really own it? Who Absolutely. It, yeah. Right? What are you observing? What are the shifts you're seeing there? And with respect to the ownership of automation initiatives? 
Well, I think it's interesting. It, it's again a, a great observation, and absolutely true about you know still today people are trying to decide. So who owns these operations that aren't in our normal locations? But to me, the companies that have, they've gone way beyond that. The guys that I know, the people that I know that I've worked with personally in my career, they move. That was a stage in this majority where they are now is that's just the location HSBC has. That's a location that Credit Suisse has. That's another location for doing finance work and tax work and operations work. It's not, um, it's not really an ownership thing because they've moved beyond like who should own that. And when you look at it from a, I guess a, a business operating logic, it's just a part of the normal quote. So who would own that if they didn't have those locations? The business would own it. IT would be an enabler to those things, right? HR is an enabler to those things to happen. Um, so when you think about locations and the, the, the labor that's in those locations, both digital and, uh, human is their business operations is what they are. Another popular model is you have individual business lines that have individual business leaders. They own everything and you just have, it's basically just like any other building and it doesn't matter. It's no different if they had a, a, a fund accounting business in Boston and they have a fund accounting business in Thailand or Costa Rica. So you just need somebody to take care of the facility, but you don't, each business owner and business line manager that's in those locations does the same kind of role they would perform if they are back in their more normalized location. Because again, as I said before, for me, the companies that we work with a lot have already moved well beyond that. Well, who owns it and who does this? You're like, no, no, it's just part of our business. It's just BAU. Right. So I, I think we're going to see the same thing. We are seeing the same thing with automation, right? Uh, you know, Blue Prism has, has made no bones about it. We're a big proponent of making technology that enables business operating people to build a digital workforce that, that they need to have in their organizations. We have the technology that we have enables a business user, a non-professional developer to build those technologies, right? It's been the way since the company was founded 21 years ago. And so who owns it is the, I think the ownership thing is dependent upon what we're talking about. If you're talking about infrastructure and platform, we always, it's in our writing about a robotic operating model. We, we advise companies. You'd use your stakeholders in your organizations where they have the strength. So for example, we don't, a business person does not want to own their IT stack. They don't want to be responsible for the backup power generators. They don't want to be spot responsible for the, uh, the, the data farm and the server farms and all the other types of things that go on. They don't want to be responsible for setting the standards and goals for system access. Uh, they don't want to take a CISO role in all these kinds of things either. So. What we always advise our customers is you do what you're best at, which is you run the business, you know, where automation could be very, very helpful to you. We'll help train people and put them in your organization so you can build it yourself along the lines that your SecOps people, compliance and risk say, okay, you have to build it like this and stay within these areas. If you go outside, it breaks security protocols and does those guys. We, we always want to make sure that you have a very strong governance around those kind of, uh, operations. We do have customers that will actually start with all the development work and all the automation work being built and delivered to the business people by it. Yes. They just, they start there. There are competitors of ours. They promote that because their technology is built where you actually have to be a coder. Um, but that's not us. So people ask me all the time. I mean, with customers every week about, well, we're thinking about moving it here. We're thinking about moving it there. And I'm like, if you're in, if you're running in business operations, what's the objective, what's not working for you to move it somewhere else, like an IT department, uh, or a production department in, uh, guys that do product development as an example. I don't think there's one model, but you know, there's preferences toward depending upon the culture and the ways that people work. What we always try to get them to do is remember why RPA was actually developed in the first time, because it was a way to help speed up what business people needed to get done. 
And technology, you know, this new intelligent automation technology is, is simpler. It's more nimble. It's easier to operate and to use. And so our advocation is always be, why wouldn't you have your IT departments working on the things that are very complex where you need pro developers and you need pro architects and engineers. You don't really need that. None of the, the all this low code, no code capability that we have now was built specifically to allow businesses to free themselves up, to focus on the things that are in front of them. They, they'll all start out with doing simple task automation, but as they get comfortable and more confident, just like we did in offshore, we'll start putting more complex tasks into the digital worker framework. We'll put tasks that would normally require multi-decision points being done by multiple people, all being done by a digital workforce and supporting technology, decision engines and such. So I think we're, we're seeing that move forward. We're seeing organizations begin to think about, is that still the right place? But I think that's very similar to what we saw in offshore, like who's going to own this at the end of the day? And I don't know that there's a wrong answer. I just know that for some organizations, they find a right answer for them that may be different than their next door neighbors. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense because I think the real confusion is uh, automation is thought of as technology and also people first, right? And the moment you put these two together, you know, CIO uh, community comes and says, look, we want to avoid creating shadow IT and therefore we should control it. And our business services will come and say, look, because you're dealing with people, we can bring in a lot of people efficiencies by globalizing, offshoring, and therefore we should also control automation, right? And like you said, there's no wrong answer, but probably enterprises have to find the answer that works for them, given their maturity and given their investments and so on, right? So uh, I think that's a, that's a, that's a good perspective. Uh, just building on that, right? Assuming that the ownership question is centered, which is the case uh, with most of your customers, like you mentioned, what are the real traits of the automation leader then, right? Who is an ideal automation leader in your view as an individual, as a, as a person uh, within an organization? I, well, and I thought about this when you said the questions over and I was thinking about people that I admire and customers that I've worked with. Then, you know, I, I try to think about when I've sat in a chief transformation officer role and what were the kind of characteristics that, you know, if I looked in the mirror every day, which you do when you get ready and you had to ask yourself those questions, like, what do you bring to the table? What's your game plan? What are these kind of things? And I think there's probably three or four that, um, are really important, at least the ones for people that I think are very successful at this. And one of the biggest one, and it's in no particular order is courage. You know, it's courage to take that first step into spaces where people are probably going to tell you no, just going to tell you no. And, but you have to have the courage to be okay with that. You have to have the courage to help inform and educate and make people aware of the different approach that you're bringing as a transformation leader, as an automation leader. And it takes time. So patience is another one. You have to have patience because you're bringing in things that people can't figure out how to put it in their paradigms. And so again, where patience is very important because you have to help educate them. You have to help inform. You got to bring them along with you. You know, one of the things you hear all the time about transformational leadership and the successful transformations versus those that work, you will hear the leaders talk about the, the importance of followership, this ability to make, allow people to understand what you're doing. And they fought, they will follow the initiative now. So bringing those people along with you is very important. So patience is key. Another one that I thought about, it's tenacity. It's that ability to stick with things that you believe are true and also have the ability to change when you realize it's not. And it, that tenacity to be okay with being told no quite often when you're being courageous and, and you're, you're you're trying to bring a new and better way forward into an organization. And so staying with it long enough so that you actually understand whether or not what you're doing is right. It's, it's a kind of combination of having the stick to itness, but also be, you know, introspective enough to understand that you're hearing enough data points that are telling you, you've got to do something or this boat's going down. Right. And you see all the time in the news and statistically speaking, 
70% of these uh, digital transformations don't make it. They don't deliver on expectations. We were talking about that earlier. There's reasons for that. It's not the technology, by the way. It's the things we're talking about right now. It's the characteristics of the person leading that. It's also about their ability. And I will, this is probably the last one I would add in there because there's so many of them. But you need to also be a bit of a psychologist. You have to be aware that you're dealing with humans and humans have this innate uh, ability to resist change. They, as we were talking before, they have, they want to find the things that, that keep them in their swim lanes that they're comfortable with. And you, you need to understand how do you help people work through change and not only the people, but how do you help the entire organization work through change? Because a lot of the more enlightened companies do change management at the individual level, but they do change management at the organizational level as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think those four or five things are the things that I think about and, you know, I look for and I admire when I see them being utilized in, in transformational people. And you can, you get kind of a vibe about it. your spidey senses stand up a little bit when you're around people like that. They're very motivating. They're very encouraging. And now that Blue Prism is part of SSNC, which is a much larger tech company, very focused on the banking, financial services industry. What does it mean for your customers going forward, your current customers and your prospective customers going forward? Just a quick point on that, Jeff. Yeah, I think from a marketing perspective, it gives us an opportunity to be in a whole different league of you know, the, the customers that we have opportunities to go talk with a meet that we would have never been able to do. Uh, secondly, I think that it gives us an opportunity to interact with, you know, the C-suite on a regular basis, because that's how SSNC does their business. Um, third, it gives us access and capability now to share their own technologies from the course platform, like their BPM platform, like their intelligent document processing platform is capable of reading the handwriting at a very, very high level. You get that push. You're also, look, it, they've got deep pockets. You know, Bill Stone runs a great company. Um, Mike McGaw, my boss is that uh, runs 20 individual businesses. He's been there 16, 17 years. They're very, very successful. They have the ability to invest in organizations like ours in technology like ours that they don't have today. It's really, really key because given access to their markets and vice versa, because we can introduce them to customers that they don't have today, you know, plus our ability to work at a different level in the organization, a higher level on a very consistent basis. And that ability to share technologies and be funded by uh, a company that has done very well and has the capital invest in, you know, our type. I think it was a great acquisition. I think it was fantastic. Uh, and you know, we're all, I think, at least from the Blue Prism side, and I know meeting with Mike and his colleagues at SSNC, they're all very excited about this. You know, this is a big acquisition for them. So I think, again, it's really, really important that, you know, this acquisition took place and now we got to take advantage of it. Absolutely. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that, John. Uh, thank you for all the valuable perspectives and speaking very candidly about your experiences over the years. Um, as we return to some sense of normalcy, these points of views will definitely provide context for how automation can help enterprises uh, and businesses move forward. And I'm certain that our listeners would find this episode really insightful. Uh, and I definitely learned quite a bit from, from this session. Your yeah, whole we'll connect back to globalization and offshoring was, uh, you know, spot on. The traits on leadership uh, that you talked about makes absolute sense. Um, so truly enjoyed, uh, you know, chatting with you, John. So thank you uh, for taking our time for this, and uh, thank you for everything that you said on the on the podcast today. Well, Bhavan, it's been a great pleasure, and it's a nice way to start my morning here. So thank you very much for that, and any time I can help, you know. Sinop or any of your customers, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out. Absolutely. And thank you everyone uh, in the audience for tuning into this episode of the Zinov podcast, Hyper Intelligent Automation Series. We will be back with another episode and another leader very soon. Till then, stay safe and take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Zinov Podcast's Hyper Intelligent Automation Series. 
We hope that you enjoyed and learned from the who's who of the global automation ecosystem. You can listen to our other series filled with similar rich perspectives on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts from. Subscribe to our newsletter on our website, www.zinoff.com, and follow us on LinkedIn to stay up to date on our latest content.